Namaskaram. Welcome to episode 104. Today is the 23rd of February and this is Sri Ayer from P Guru's channel. I would like to now welcome my co-host Sridhar Chityala Ji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar and good morning to you, sir. Good morning to everybody. Sir, let us start with uh, what Trump plans to do at his meeting in CPAC. Looks like he has a big announcement to make, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I think that uh, if you recall, we had covered yesterday morning that um, that he would be attending and he would be speaking on the last day uh, in his priorities and focus were to be around China, manufacturing, small business, uh, immigration, bringing manufacturing jobs back, etc. Um, now, today, the breaking news or late last night, the breaking, breaking news is that that he is likely he wants to be or he may announce that he is the presumptive presidential candidate or nominee for 2024 uh, elections to come. So this kind of, uh, you know, predict, uh, you know, precludes a lot of other people who might be hopefuls like Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or any of the Republican governors who may be fancying their chances. It also kind of unites the party behind him, or at least he gets a fairly clear indication as of how much the party, how much of the party is behind him, isn't it? It does. I think that the um, given he has continued to enjoy wide support amongst the Republican Party, which is over seventy-five percent. Today's poll states: should he quit and form uh, his own party? close to 56% will leave Republican Party and join him. So all these polls kind of indicate that there is a continued support. Lindsey Graham has stated without Trump, 2022-2024 uh, elections are unwinnable. He remains the most influential candidate. Those sentiments have been endorsed not just by Lindsey Graham, but it's also been endorsed by you know, Jim Jordan and a few other uh, senators very, uh, you know, who have been with him, including Ted Cruz. Um, so I think that the, um, as you rightly pointed out, that once the candidate is known, then it becomes very clear to the party to unite behind and focus around the, the campaign organization and orchestration of what is to come in the next four years. So that's what this trend will lay the framework. Now, um, Newt Gingrich has uh, demanded that Cuomo should resign, resign after the ex-Department of uh, Justice official says that the state stonewalled a probe. What is this probe, sir, and uh, do you think that uh, your governor is in trouble? My governor is never in trouble. We are a liberal, we are a liberal state, uh, and we can pretty much do anything and kind of get away um, because we have a very collaborative uh, you know, federal government. Um, Andrew Cuomo is a big figure in the Democratic Party. Um, once the, because there was, if you recall, when we were covering going back in April, May, June timeframes, New York had, you know, very high number of cases relative to the rest of the United States in COVID. One just could not figure out. And constantly President Trump was blamed. And even today, those who are ignorant and naive, uh, you know, I know we will get some adverse comments, continue to blame President Trump uh, as the person responsible because mainstream media doesn't cover when, for example, the PPE, uh, the masks were given. He went and chose to order the masks from China. And uh, when there was a ship at the Javits Center that was sent to address the needs of the uh, of the, um, uh, the Manhattan and New York uh, particularly Manhattan to treat the patients, uh, he chose to ignore. It's now becoming evident that he didn't want this count to be escalated and count to be reflected as a glaring number and the CCH to, um, um, uh, sorry, CDC to uh, initiate a probe. Um, and that has come out with his own secretary admitting that that was the case, and close to 50% of the cases have been suppressed. There is no investigation. Even the Democratic Party members are suggesting that he should go. Um, if it is the case, if it is the truth, as the, as the secretary 
uh, has Rosa has pointed out, then it's a very serious situation of misreporting the numbers and whether there was, you know, an opportunity where the Fed, federal government could have intervened and helped to recover and retrieve the situation given the perilous position that we were in. Now, um, the presumptive Attorney General, Merrick Garland, has said that he has not investigated or he has not talked about Hunter Biden to the President. Should we read something into it or should we wait and see what happens or what are your thoughts? Well, the three essential things that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, Mr. Garland's position, one is uh, he, has, he has not confirmed whether Durham was appointed as the deputy uh, by the by uh, Mr. Barr as he was leaving, he has not confirmed what he would do to him because he's supposed to be investigating the Hunter Biden and the Russian um, interference case, continue to uh, uh, kind of uh, follow through on that. He has not made a statement on Hunter Biden. He's basically saying that he has not spoken with him. Imagine, um, you know, the incoming attorney general nominee not speaking with a very specific and controversial issue that propped up on the eve of the elections. The third, I think, has also been silent on what the situation, how you would have dealt with, especially on the Portland kind of the riots. And the fourth, for which he has, that this is a political rhetoric, is as he is going to personally monitor and supervise the prosecution of the Capitol Hill <coughs> rioters uh, and make sure that they get uh, the, the law uh, takes its course. So he's been very selective, playing to the Democratic gallery uh, in the House, Senate, so that his nomination gets through. Now, um, Nina Tandon for OMB looks like this nomination is running into trouble because now Susan Collins of the Republican side, a senator, also has said that she would not be supporting her. And I think I read somewhere that even Mitt Romney said that he will not be supporting her. So what are the odds that she's still going to get the OMB uh, nomination? It very much depends on Obama more than Biden. What's the kind of, uh, he, is the, he is the influential czar of the De Democratic Party. He is the invisible hand, perhaps Michelle Obama. So Biden is just a person navigating the process. So most of these nominations have, appears to have come from you know, that side of the fence. So uh, how exactly they will galvanize the party to get her through remains to be seen. But there is a growing chorus, both within the Democratic as well as the Republican Party, around her questionable competence in terms of managing the OMB. If I am correct, also Bernie Sanders had some reservations about her too. John Kerry has uh, held, had held back-channel negotiations with the Iran's ambassador to the United States while Trump was still in power. What is one to make of that? Well, yesterday we heard the news, uh, which we which we reported in P Gurus, that uh, there was uh, some senior officials from the previous Obama administration uh, who has had four lays with um, with uh, the Iranian ambassador, who is a very fluent uh, speaker, who is educated in the United States. Uh, it's today coming to, coming to, coming uh, last night, yesterday, it's becoming very clear that Robert Malley also has held discussions in October, November 2019. Uh, John Kerry has had discussions with her, with, uh, with the Mr. Uh, um, the Iranian ambassador. Um, or His Excellency, you know, Indian is not Mr. as somebody would like to point out, His Excellency, uh, the Iranian ambassador. Um, and what it points out to me is two things. One, as someone said in the headline, um, John Kerry never got out of bed with the Iranians. He still is continuing. That's one big headline that was. What is more intriguing and what is equally perplexing is can a past president can a past president interfere and undermine the authority of a sitting elected United States president? If it was Obama, 
and Obama and officials were directed by him. It, clearly, there's no Biden's names men mentioned in any of these reports. Um, then it raises concerns as to whether there was a deliberate attempt. There was, if you read the report, which I think P. Gurus will publish, which will publish, it says that in the event that there is a change in government in 2020, um, there, is, there is ground laid for reopening the doors with the Iranians. This is when Trump was doing well, the economy was doing well, he had a good I'm not talking about this national polls, which the mainstream media projects and you know gives these wide-ranging percentages. But this is about within the Republican Party and the general kind of the percentages. So having said that, is all this being done basically with some kind of preconceived data that was available to people like Obama? And under what authority that they could have these type of discussions when they know that there is a president? And this is the time, if you recall, the 19, it was very hot because there was restrictions, there was, uh, uh, there was more sanctions, uh, Iran was under tight news, um, you know, Israel had somewhere around that time taken out the big depot in Lebanon, which had cache of arms supplied by Iran, meant to be alleged to be supplied by Iran. So lots of things that was going on at that point of time. And then that slipped into 2020. So it raises some questions sir, in terms of, uh, you know, having these discussions. Let's take a look at uh, the Pennsylvania GOP mail-in ballot case. Looks like Supreme Court has rejected that one too. And uh, this was something that perhaps the President Trump had pinned his hopes on, that maybe he would get a favorable decision. Can you explain or expand on this a little bit? I cannot explain logically what is seems to be illogical. Sam Alito, who is a sitting Supreme Court judge, made a clear observation that those that were votes that came after, and because the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and the and the secretary had uh, come up with a procedure and a law which says that they could accept these postal ballots three days after. Sam Alito had passed a ruling to set aside these two, one which fell on the normal course, one which came, you know, all those things that came after. Now, basically to be counted separately, leave alone being counted, nothing happened. The election results were announced. It goes to the Supreme Court out of no reason, um, which only the, his, uh, the, the lords of the SCOTUS can interpret. Uh, set aside, perhaps, you know, elections is over, there's no point in going back. But Clarence Thomas and um, Sam Alito uh, and uh, Neil Farouche, uh, Neil Garouche, have made a string stinging dissent, basically saying, if Supreme Court is not the place, or SCOTUS in this instance, is not the place to clarify the law and the role of legislature in enacting the rules and process, then I'm not sure which is the body to do this. And would you allow, this was the same case that was contested by the Texas uh, Attorney General as well. So I think SCOTUS has landed itself into a lot of hot water in terms of dismissing the cases, justifying all these Democrats all these uh, liberals who said, this is a no case, so therefore the election is done. So we are going to be in a situation where there is going to be no investigation on breach of rules, no violation of constitution, no procedures as to who is the person who is supposed to be the authority in laying down the rules, and all other kind of you know, fraudulent events that was alleged. Everything is going to be cast aside. You know, it's certainly the United States looks in this instance like a third world country, to be honest. And Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi wants uh, the United States and the West to lift all sanctions and also stop meddling in its affairs, namely in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan and so on. Um, he, might, he might as well ask for the kitchen sink. It looks like they want everything, isn't it? It is. It is. You see, what's happening is 
they don't know whether Obama is running United, United States uh, invisible or whether Biden is running, uh, you know, the the uh, the government. You have inconsistent statements coming out. You have lack of clarity on Myanmar. On, and then, of course, now they are making a statement that, you know, they're going to have more impositions of more bans being imposed. Today, two generals um, were imposed as, uh, with some sanctions. Then you have these Iran negotiations, which is up and down, uh, and then, you know, coming back. Today, also, Biden makes a statement, which is to say, you know, WHO officials must, must really dig deep to find the answers on the origins of COVID. And WHO officials yesterday said we were denied information. The documents that relates to the origins has been denied to us by CCP, not the Chinese government. So you can see that the present administration is sitting like a duck, lame duck. And of all the people, Wang Yi making a statement, get off my back and, you know, and then further start engaging people to people dialogue, lift the sanctions, trade sanctions that exist. And by the way, we're going to have troops all around the world and we're going to harass you in Taiwan. We're going to harass Japan in Senkaku. We're going to harass you in South China Sea. And by the way, you back off from all these kinds of human rights stuff and get on because we are more powerful than you. That's the message Wang Yi is giving. Now take a, let's take a look at uh, global news. And uh, 2021 might be the year of multilateralism. And also it could be a, a turning point in the history of the world. Why do you think so? There are three types of alliances which are which are emerging. One is the COVID alliance, which is which is you know on the back of the old sorry Quad alliance. I stand corrected, not COVID Quad alliance, which is emerging on the back of the the architecture that was presented by Trump to the Quad at that point of time. Britain, Germany, and France got itself entangled. So therefore, to, they see that as uh, a very important part of the, the security, trade, and commerce architecture, because we have discussed it ad nauseum on the topic. It's also home to 54, 55% of GDP. So you have one set. On the same, going extending into Indian Ocean, you have another alliance, which is Turkey, Iran, and China. So you have the second. Then coming, getting to this side, to the Atlantic, now Boris Johnson is saying that NATO was neglected. And um, so we should now reestablish the, uh, the NATO. So he calls it as the transatlantic quad, comprising of Germany, United States, France, and, um, and um, Mr. Uh, and UK. Why, where's the threat? Russia. Now, when you look at the policy of Biden, you know, the Nordstrom pipe, which goes from Russia into Germany, into Europe, Biden has stated no further sanctions. Contrary to what? And that was the whole point of contention. And Nablin, Na, Nablini, you know, the opposition leader is arrested. The issue has died. And Initially, EU raised objections. So what we are saying is, this is the format of multilateralism. And I have to, I, I, I should not ignore the West Asia Israel peace deal, where that stands with the context of what United States is doing with Iran. So we are in a kind of very strategic and nimble formation of alliances, which has become, which is being shaped by lack of leadership in the United States. That's why I say that this is very polarizing. And in other news, uh, Minister of External Affairs of India, Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar is visiting Mauritius amidst political tensions over there. Um, is this like a re reassuring visit or is he trying to calm down some tempers in Mauritius, sir? I think that first and foremost, it's a reassuring visit. I think the second is he's close, close to both Mr. Anirudh as well as Mr. Boda, I think, the foreign, foreign minister, um, and with whom he has negotiated the trade deals. Both of them have welcomed the visit. So 
you know, he's, he's clearly going there not with just making sure that the, um, the relationships are intact, but he's also going there for some political kind of, I would say, compromises to work out in the event that there is a transition or in the event there is a status quo. And in Thailand, the prime minister has survived a second no confidence motion, but the protests have now started happening on the streets and the protesters were trying to storm the parliament house. Um, Thailand was at best a military control controlled system. I don't know of any democracy there. What are your thoughts? Is this a puppet government just like Myanmar and other countries or Pakistan uh, or uh, is there more substance to it this time? You have, uh, you know, put the strategic context behind this. There's always army, there's always the royalty, uh, and then there's always this, um, the corrupt government which is prevalent in Thailand. Um, but he has a majority, I think something like 272 to 206 votes. Um, is obviously the, uh, the local policies in terms of the economy and other factors. Remember, China also faces, Thailand also faces threat from the Chinese on the Mekong River, which is one of the big areas of their rural Thailand and agro development, which is one of the key, um, what shall I say, uh, with fisheries, which is the key uh, economic activity and uh, jobs for the broader Thailand economy. So I think you are seeing a lot of discontent at the people's level, while at the urban level you have superficial, um, uh, what you call peace and tranquility prevailing. So that's what you are witnessing. Um, it is very heavily, as you know, his money plays a big part in Thailand. And, and hence, you are seeing the, uh, the turbulence. He has survived the second one. And he's got a big majority, 272 to 2. It's not like, you know, he's hanging by razor thin edge. And uh, in markets, uh, federal chairman will be speaking to the Congress twice this week, and one wonders uh, what he's going to be telling. Perhaps that uh, their interests are going to stay low for an extended period of time. What are your thoughts? I think it's just going to. Um, the Fed is always looking at data differently. They have their own data. Um, their forecast to 2021 to be a good year. They predicted the for GDP growth to be 4.3%. Um, but there's also enough slush of cash that is being put in. The markets have done well. There is a fear. And um, if you exactly go back one year, which is around February, March, the 10-year T-bonds were around 1.3% roughly somewhere around that number. Roll the clock forward, it's about 1.34% today. So the bond yields have risen. So the question that may come up is whether the rise in yields in the bonds is early indication of pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates. Then you I've got the I've got the drawing up there, sir. Please continue. Yeah. And then uh, when you kind of uh, move three months later, which is April, um, around end of April, April 23, 24, 25, around that when the pandemic is formally announced and the numbers begin to shoot up, if you recall, the rates dipped to 0.64%. Around December, January, October, November, November, December, we saw the interest rates were at abnormally low and people were able to get 30-year, 15-year mortgage. 30-year mortgage is around 2.5%. So now the fear is, the fear in the, among the mind of the investors in the markets is, we are still not out of the pandemic, but the yield is at 1.3%. So is there pressure to raise the interest rates to bring the yield you know, a little bit down the curve, which always does the opposite. So the story is, this is what is driving the minds and question around um, what exactly, um, you know, Powell is going to say. Thus far, even in the last meeting, he had mentioned that still there's a lot of neglected segments of the community which are out of jobs and which need help. 
So we cannot raise rates um, on the back of what we see in the markets, which is effectively the stimulus money. Um, uh, now let's quickly wrap up on Bitcoin. It has fallen 10% after Elon Musk said that it was overvalued. And Janet Yellen has also said that Bitcoin is a very inefficient way of transferring money. Um, could you please touch upon these two and why do you think that uh, Elon Musk thinks that Bitcoin is overvalued? Well, I think Ellen is talking about uh, Bitcoin as a commodity and it's, it has got no intrinsic commercialization or intrinsic value beyond it being a unit of uh, listed as a, a, a commodity uh, for trading. So she is saying is obviously trying to cool the prices is to say that, you know, why is this 50, what is in it for it to be $50,000? Is there going to be a demand that's coming? That's Janet Ellen's point of view. As far as um, Elon Musk is concerned, he invested a billion dollars. He's already made a billion. We reported a billion dollars when he has bought billion dollars worth. And what is the ecosystem that Tesla could be building out of this? He's made billion dollars profit since we said that. And it's not long ago. It's probably less than a month or so uh, when, he, when he made that announcement. So suddenly when he sees on one day the it going up by 10, 12 percent and then coming back, uh, then he's saying, look, this, there's a problem with uh, the trading on this. The volatility is too high. Today, actually, it dipped 10 percent and eventually it recovered. Uh, when I say recover, it's about 5.5% down or 6% down by the end of the day. So I think that is uh, Tesla's uh, Elon statement, which is to say this irrational pricing uh, cannot be sustained. Having said that, the markets are predicting the Bitcoin to be crossing $100,000 before the end of the year. Well, it's almost double of where it is today, which is at 54000 So let's wait and see how things play out. And lastly, Biden has announced that he's tweaking the PPP, Payment Protection Plan, to help some of the small business owners. And I think that's a welcome move. Uh, three, four months ago, I had mentioned this, that those companies or those small businesses where the owner is, a, it's like a single man, single person company. The owner doesn't take a salary unless there is a profit turned by the company. And since the person is not taking a salary, therefore, he's not having a paycheck. And therefore, he was missing out on PPP. And let's wait and see how the new plan helps such one person or husband and wife owned small businesses and uh, help them also. After all, everybody is suffering in this uh, pandemic. Uh, Sridharji, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll be back again tomorrow, same time, same place. Namaskar. Uh, Namaskar, sir. One um, important announcement on behalf of PGUs. Uh, we're going to have a fireside chat for 20 minutes with Mohandas Pai um, on the rising oil prices or petrol prices in, in India um, to share his views on the, from an Indian perspective. I think uh, Professor Vaidyanathan has already given his piece of view. So, I think uh, Sri IRG tries to bring various people's perspectives so people can get an understanding of what each of the people are thinking um, as to this price. Is it a uh, political fatality or is this something that one has to live as a normal course of life? And that would be starting in about 30 minutes from now. Thank you very much, sir. And Namaskar. Namaskar and thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.